since lockdown began, Mrs. Biscuit has made a bid to take over my rooftop observatory with her plants. I haven't been able to get to the hairdressers and loads and loads and loads of you have asked me what telescope should they buy. Well, let me give you a warning because I'm not altogether sure you're ready for this. The thing is, there are a lot of different scopes to choose from. And if you're not careful, you can end up like this guy, drowning in a sea of unused astro equipment and geekery. To avoid this fate, me and a bunch of nerds from around the world are going to be on hand to guide you. We're going to list the top four scopes for astronomy, starting with my specialist subject, the most budgety. Right, well, I'm going to get your hooks with something cheap. For £100, you can have this. Now, they come with many different names, but these 80 millimetre wide refractors are generally all made in the same factory in China. Oh, I just want to show you the lens. Oh. <laughs> All it is, is two glass elements. Here's one, and here's the other, held apart with a little bit of sticky tape just to give them a little bit of air in between. So there's very little between your eyes and the photons coming in from here from a distant galaxy. It's nice, it's simple, and it really does hit an optical sweet spot. And although the dealers will try and tempt you with supersonic, super fancy ED glass. I believe that this refractor with its simple crown and flint glass is gonna surprise you. And I'm willing to risk life and limb to prove it. It was then that I realized moving the plants would have been a much better option. <laughs> okay, let's kick off with that beauty up there, the moon. There, there she is. All right, let's find out. Can a cheap scope deliver amazing views? It's absolutely crystal clear. Look at that. All these shots, by the way, are taken through the scope. Yeah, it looks cool, but let's have a closer view, shall we? Let's pop a better eyepiece in, more zoomed in. Because the human eye has more dynamic range than a camera, this actually looks better through the eyepiece. Over there, bright star is Jupiter. Again, I couldn't quite match the human eye. So this is a composite showing the moons and Jupiter. This is sort of what it looked like, but better. Uh, I, can, I mean, I think this will blow you away, honestly. At the moment, to see Jupiter and Saturn, which is following it, we're having to look through a lot of wobbly atmosphere. For a big scope, this would be a problem. But for a small one like this, it isn't, simply because we're not that zoomed in. This cheap scope is kicking ass. Okay, what next? You know, I'd really love to show you something in deep space. And that's a problem from London, because deep space objects are very, very dim, and London's sky is very, very bright. So surely, with this very cheap budget scope, we're not gonna be able to see anything. You'd think, wouldn't you? Well, we're gonna give it a try and search for something relatively bright that's actually outside our galaxy and to help find it through the Merc, I'm using the Skyview app. Okay, let's see if it's there. Ah, there it is. Wow. I can actually see it. This ball of stars. This is what it looked like through London's Merc, but if I turn up the camera's exposure and try and mimic somewhere dark, it looks like this. The globular cluster contains 200,000 stars and it's taken 20,000 years for the light to reach my roof. And pretty amazing, huh? And I know for a fact that you can see things like the Orion Nebula through this scope from London. And if you go somewhere dark, then wide field views should be really very good with this. I told you this was a good scope. 
and as long as I don't plunge to my death, this evening will have been worth it. Link to the cheapest place to buy one below, and happily, if you use the link, you'll be helping the channel too. But maybe you want to see the universe even brighter and in more detail. Well, in that case, you need the best visual scope there is in the world, which was designed in the 50s in California by a monk at the Vendanta Monastery. John Jobson had to perfect his Dobsonian design without the chief monk catching on, which must have been quite tricky because what makes these scopes so good is that they're big. Actually, the physics is a bit more precise. It's the fatness, the aperture that's key. And this is the scope that hooked 15-year-old astro YouTuber Helena from Scotland. So what's that you've got behind you? So this is my Skywatcher 10-inch Dobsonian. So it's a huge mirror. It's a light bucket, basically. And for visual astronomy, a light bucket is exactly what you need because those nebula are so faint, you need to catch as many photons as possible to see them. What does Orion look like? Orion's sort of this purple, purpley green haze. And it was really well magnified, really big in the field of view. That's amazing, isn't it? That you actually can see the colour. Yeah, it does not. The other advantage of having a big aperture is that you can really crank up the magnification and get in really close on the moon and the planets. I've seen moons passing over Jupiter, I've seen Saturn and the Cassini division. The only real problem with this design is that they're, well, big, but it's worth it. If you can manage to um, take the 10 inch around, if you have the space for it, definitely go for the 10 over the eight. And if you have loads of space, unlimited space, and you don't need to take it around, go for the 12. But the 10 is sort of the middle man here. And if you want to buy one, check out my recommendations on the website, link below. Next up, the best scope for astrophotography. Now, if you see my last video where we took a 150 mm wide Newtonian, stuck it on an old Celestron CG4 mount and managed to take these amazing pictures on a budget of just £600, then you might think I'm going to recommend this setup. I did. I even wrote it up on the website. And yet for some reason, in deepest, darkest Birmingham, Astro Stace dares to disagree with his royal biscuitness. Hi! <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with Newtonians then? I like Newtonians. A lot of people love Newtonians and, well, one point is you can't see vampires with them. <laughs> That's true, um, especially alien vampires approaching Earth. Yeah, yeah. useless, wouldn't it? So, no, they just, I just find them so big and unwieldy um, and like the slightest knock and it knocks them out of collimation. Oh, collimation. I mean, that is a fair point. Also, you get sold laser collimators and the bloody laser collimators aren't collimated <laughs> and so there's levels of pain yeah and it, it's not that hard to learn but it is a skill that it is an extra skill that does need to no, be you're right. learned fair point astro stace after all the first time i tried astrophotography was a complete disaster when will the pain end basically there's so many things that go wrong when you're doing astrophotography just work that you don't want to have to worry about collimation you don't want to have to, it to be a major pain in the bum to get the bloody thing set up. And if you've got a big old Newtonian, it is a major pain in the bum. And there's one, there's one sort of point I haven't touched on. A lot of targets, like these big nebulas in space, they're huge. You're so right, Stace. People do not realise a lot of the targets are like five times yeah, bigger than the moon. Like, I mean, look at Andromeda, for example. One of the first targets that most people go for. And that is big. For wannabe astrophotographers, the abundance of really big deep space objects is a game changer because you don't need to be zoomed in to take pictures like this one. The big difference actually between astrophotography and visual is that both astrophotography and visual, they want to get as many photons as you can. But astrophotography, you can do it in a different way. You just have your camera shut, just stay open for ages and the light comes in. Uh, whereas for visual, obviously your eyes working instantly, so you need a big light bucket. But um, astrophotographers can cheat and you can do so much with a small setup. So, guess how big the telescope was that shot this picture from my roof in London? 
Go on, have a guess. Well, actually, you don't have to, because here it is. Not very big, is it? Stasis convinced me a little scope on a little mount is what you need. And if you ever decide to go bigger, you'll end up persuading your better half that you need to keep this rig as your travel setup. Details of best prices and brands on the website. Last up, the best all round scope. Could it be this guy? The SCT. It's my cardboard G shield. Unfortunately, it doesn't come with a cardboard G shield. But apart from that, it's brilliant. It's fat, which means it's great for visual. And it's not so big that you can't put it on a mount and use it for astrophotography. Also in contention, a four or five inch fancy glass refractor. No one can afford anything fatter than this, but optically, they are the best. So to decide once and for all, we're gonna go down under and visit my buddy Tim. Cause this lucky boy all right, mate. has both. If you were to take one scope out with you somewhere dark, just one, what would it be? Well, the thing you'll hear about um, people who, who own these refractors, they'll say, oh, um, I love the snap of the focus. So when you turn the focus all of a sudden, boom, you'll get this lovely razor sharp image. And you do, you do. It, uh, I must say that that is great. But if I'm just taking one scope, I go for the aperture. So I would go for the nine and a quarter. I've seen some fantastic, fantastic things uh, through the nine and a quarter, which I don't think um, this would quite match up to in terms of spectacle. Visually, the SCT has it, but photographically I'm in a quandary because my Apo refractor takes beautiful, crisp images like this one. But then again, the resolution of the SCT wins out when you chase very distant deep space targets. Even Rick was impressed when we bagged these colliding galaxies 20 million light years away. It was a good shot. And of course, the SCT is a favourite amongst the world's best planetary photographers, like His Majesty Damien Peach. It's Damien Peach! <laughs> and I know a drummer and geek called Deddy Dayag, who camps in Israel's awesome Negev desert with his big fat 11 inch SCT and takes on the refractors at their own game. Uh, the first time I went to the desert and I saw, you know, other guys uh, imaging there. Everybody told me, you know, you're not going to, going to be able to take any pictures with it. It's not it's just not suitable for deep space. But by attaching a hyperstar lens and camera on the front of the scope, Dead is able to transform his SCT into a wide field, super fast astrograph. You know, the first night with the hyperstar and, and captured seven objects and they were, they were amazed. And something that you wouldn't dream about doing it with, a, you know, with a small refractor. All right, thanks, Deddy. And I think that seals it, really. The SCT is the best all-round, bang-for-your-buck wow factor, single one-stop shop telescope you can get. I do just need to caveat, though, that taking deep space photos through it is not a walk in the park, and you might be better off with a fancy glass ED refractor because they're a lot more straightforward. <laughs> That wraps it up. Many thanks to my fellow nerds for helping me choose the best four scopes for astronomy. If you're thinking about buying one, please go to the Astro Biscuit website, where there are more details on brands and links which will help support the channel. Some of my links, but not all, will earn me a commission, which is fantastic, and they're still the cheapest, so it's win-win. And as always, check out the fantastic Richtenstein's music. Uh, here is me introducing him to his first scope, which is one that I haven't mentioned. Uh, it's a Mac. And actually, I will mention it on the website. It's a great small little starter scope for planets, although I'm not sure he fully loves it yet. OK, here are a selection of mine and Rick's favourite Astro Biscuit missions. Please check them out. And in the next show, I'm hoping to find the answer to life, the universe and everything. Hopefully, we'll do it in under 20 minutes. Anyway, take care. Bye. <laughs>